The state of security in 2022 with retired Air Force Brigadier General Greg Tuhill. He's now director of the CERT division of the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Greg, tell us about yourself and, and the things that you've done. Towards the end of the Obama administration and after OPM, uh, the president decided that we needed to have a chief information security officer. So uh, I was appointed into that position as the, the very first federal chief information security officer and uh, went through the end of the Obama administration doing that. Uh, after I left uh, federal service at the end of the Obama administration, I, I did two different paths. I uh, became a professor here at Carnegie Mellon at the Heinz College, but I also joined industry. And uh, not only did I serve as uh, president of uh, AppGate, which is a cybersecurity startup, I also served on boards of uh, Symantec, Splunk, and Intel, uh, Bay Dynamics, and Cyberspots. So I got a really great experience in industry. And when this job came open here at the Software Engineering Institute, I was recruited to come here. Um, and now I'm at the what I consider the top of the pyramid, as it were, uh, leading a team of brilliant researchers and engineers whose mission is to help better protect national security and national prosperity by hardening the cyber ecosystem. What do you consider to be the, the landscape, the security, cybersecurity landscape today at this moment in time? I would give the state of cybersecurity right now uh, the grade of being unsettled. And, and here's why. You know, as we take a look at pros versus cons, some of the pros in the environment today is, is we really have some great technologies that continue to be fielded uh, to better secure our infrastructure. Um, we also have uh, the government taking the lead in implementing and promoting the zero trust security strategy. And notice I say zero trust strategy, not zero trust architectures or the technology. It starts with strategy and uh, kudos to the government for moving forward with that. And then um, I'm also seeing that, you know, the marketplace is responding to things like small and medium businesses that need some help uh, with the development of managed services, uh, you know, security services providers or MSSPs. Those are really positive things. And I'm also seeing increased information sharing. So four elements that I think are really pro, but they're offset by some of the cons that are uh, still out there. Um, first of all, I'd say that, you know, as you're taking a look at the reliance on information technology, we certainly saw during the pandemic thus far, it's really highlighted the reliance that we have on information technology and a secure, trusted cyber ecosystem. Um, secondly, we still are seeing a lot of integration issues. And as you go to integrate more things, you also are increasing your risk exposure. And we have many organizations that don't necessarily have a good handle on their risk exposure, particularly as they are integrating in information technology with operational technology, industrial control systems, such as uh, billing systems that are linked to the pumps valve switches out in the field. That's a great example of where we see administrative systems and industrial control or operational systems tied together. That increases risk exposure. And then the last two uh, cons are uh, complexity is continuing to plague our uh, human element, uh, the wetware uh, that's involved in systems, because complexity is the bane of security. And we keep on having products that are fielded that take literally months or years to master. And we have a, a confounded workforce that is struggling to keep up from a cognition standpoint. And then finally, we continue to see that it is a very inexpensive entry for offensive attackers. They, anybody who has enough money to go buy a Kindle or a low-end laptop uh, can, with uh, sufficient access to the internet, go on to YouTube, for example, and take training courses on how to hack and can become a very proficient hacker. 
So I, I, taking a look at those pros and those cons, I, I, I see it still being a very unsettled state right now. And I think that's something that uh, we all need to be aware of, that we, we have a lot of pros, but there's also a lot of risk exposure remaining. So let me ask you a question just to drill down on a point that you made. This intersection of the administrative systems with the operational systems and that basic architecture leading to greater security risk. How, how did that get designed in and what can we do about that? And, and I ask because we, we read about this problem and it's obviously a very severe issue and very common. It is a very common issue, but it's also been underneath the radar for a lot of uh, different organizations because um, as you went as a company to take a look at how do I make myself more efficient and lower costs, many organizations uh, said, well, you know what, I'm going to go and I'm going to uh, reduce my manpower costs, which are very expensive. And, uh, you know, we've got electrical meters, we've got gas meters in critical infrastructure. And we used to have people who would go around house to house, business to business, and read the electrical meter and read the gas meter. And as you take a look at the cost and the value proposition, automating that and linking, you know, those type of metering systems reduces the manpower and labor costs. Uh, so I use that as an exemplar, but as we go and we link those different systems together with billing and stuff like that, then we have to tie them together. And often, if you have somebody who is a, uh, a network architect who's being told, hey, you've got to connect these two together, boom, they'll go do that. But folks don't necessarily make the cognitive leap that, oh, these systems now uh, are electrically connected. And if I can see it as a cyber operator, I can go get it. Uh, so every organization out there really needs to have positive control of their architectures and know how things are put together and plugged in. And that's the acme of skill that many organizations have yet to master. And once again, it's an exemplar of how complexity is the bane of security. So then fundamentally is the issue one of insufficient training on security issues, or is there, is it an enterprise architecture issue? Where is the root here? Some of this is uh, legacy activities from well before some of the people who are in the current jobs, um, it, it, it just came that way because their predecessors we're plugging it in in the 90s and trying to bring these two together to have a more efficient business. Um, so we're finding, and uh, I certainly, when I was at DHS and we were working with critical infrastructure providers, we would do penetration testing in red teams to show them how we could, in fact, uh, leap over and get between the IT and the OT, leveraging some of these activities that were. Uh, plugged together with all of the best intentions. And uh, with that complexity, making sure that you have a good handle through enterprise architecture, discovery through pen testing and red teams to see if anybody plugged it in that you didn't know about. All of those are part of the calculus for today's best uh, practice. Every executive, every board, every IT staffer, every operational staff, the whole company needs to uh, have situational awareness as to how things are put together and what those risks are. I'm assuming that this type of organized situational awareness that you're describing is not sufficiently prevalent because of the fact, as, as evidenced by the fact that there are so many privacy breaches, ransomware attacks, and so forth. This is happening all the time. Things are getting better in many areas, though, Michael. You know, we, we now have tools that are helping um, IT staffs uh, map their networks and uh, have better situational awareness. Um, however, as you take a look at some of the connections, some of them are um, uh, they're, they're not persistent. They'll pop up, pop down. 
But even then, the technology is getting better for detecting some of these things. Uh, yet, that said, uh, we still need to be aware of what the adversary is looking for uh, and start thinking like a hacker. Uh, and as such, you know, it, it all boils down to your data. As a war college graduate, I was uh, obliged to always quote a dead German. Uh, in every public speech. <laughs> um, so I'm going to quote from Frederick the Great today, who said, he who uh, defends everything defends nothing. Uh, so one of the best practices we've seen is making sure, first of all, before you even put your defenses together, that you understand your data. All data is not equal. You need to understand the value of your data and protect proportionately. And then further, you, you get great value by doing things like red teaming and pen testing. When you're thinking like a hacker, often you find risk exposure that you didn't even know you had. Uh, so, you know, for IT professionals out there, we think it's the best practice to do those regular exercises where you are doing pen testing, you are doing red teaming. And, and if you are developing code or if you're hanging out websites and the like, Consider a, a bug bounty program as well to help you understand what your risk exposure is and to better control those risks that you have. Now, let's take a moment. Please subscribe to our newsletter. Hit the subscribe button at the top of our website so you can stay up to date on our upcoming live shows. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. So, Greg, given the challenges that are faced by the largest companies in the world with these data breaches, so what's going wrong? You know, the, it seems like as you've been describing, the solutions or the preventions are, are known to us. So what goes wrong? I will start by emphasizing, though, that there's a lot of things going right. Uh, as we've taken a look at how reliant our economy is, our national security enterprise, uh, all, all of this is reliant on a safe and assured and secure IT infrastructure. And our, our economy is coming back from the, the pandemic extremely strong. And uh, as I would contend, during the pandemic, information technology and our ability to do sessions like like this, the video teleconferences, the remote uh, workforce pivot, all of that is a pro and so it should be something that we celebrate. But that said, we have adversaries out there that are actively seeking um, access to our data, trying to uh, seek a competitive advantage, trying to uh, shake us down for money, such as the ransomware crooks that are out there. And how are they slipping through? Well, as I take a look at uh, my taxonomy for the threats that are out there, you know, we continue to see the vast majority, and uh, by vast majority, I contend that the evidence shows that uh, about 95% plus of all cyber incidents are caused by careless, negligent, indifferent, or confounded people who haven't properly installed configured, or um, likewise done the right things with the information technology that they have. And there's contributing factors there, such as complex systems. Um, and uh, as a Star Trek fan, and uh, you know, many of us in the technology world uh, certainly are fans of science fiction, um, to, to paraphrase Scotty, uh, the chief engineer of the enterprise, um, the, the more complex you make it, the easier it is to break it. And as a former military cyber operator, we were always looking for seams. Um, and in the physical world, as a, a commander of a base, you know, we would do the base defense exercises. And, you know, we would always look for seams in the adversary's defenses. And that's where we're seeing cyber adversaries following the lead of the physical world and looking for seams in our cyber defenses, interfaces human elements, the wetware not doing what they're supposed to be doing from a configuration, installation, et cetera, not patching properly. All of those create seams 
that are easily identifiable with some of the scanning tools that are out there and then can be leveraged by cyber attackers. We have uh, some interesting questions from Twitter and it, and it relates to this. So Arsalan Khan, who listens a lot and he's a great, he, he has these great questions. He says he read somewhere that two thirds of the government is helped by government contractors that are small and mid-sized businesses. When government contracts are based on cost, then cybersecurity may not be the first thing that's on the mind of these contractors. They're focused on low cost rather than high secure. What do we do about this? My recommendation and the recommendation out of our organization at, at the Software Engineering Institute CERT division is that high-performing organizations, whether in government or outside of government, make cybersecurity a requirement. Uh, you don't guess that they're going to have proper cybersecurity controls. You make it a requirement uh, that they have proper uh, cybersecurity controls. And then further, uh, depending on your risk appetite, you can buy down your risk even further by writing in the requirements such as uh, I want an independent third-party audit, uh, a regular audit of that vendor, independent third-party regular audit to make sure that their cybersecurity controls are in place and that they're properly followed. We're seeing some uh, more organizations, not only in government like the Department of Defense, but in the private sector as well, that are now putting those cybersecurity requirements in place and they're following through with that independent third-party audit capability. Now, I am aware of the Department of Defense's uh, initiative for the uh, cybersecurity capability maturity uh, model that they have uh, been looking towards. That's still a work in progress, uh, but we here uh, at the Software Engineering Institute's CERT division, we applaud efforts like that where you are baking in cybersecurity and cy uh, secure by design upfront, not only in your code and your uh, hardware uh, and your wetware, but in your processes as well. So hopefully that's helpful for organizations everywhere, not just in government. And we have another question from Twitter, and this is from Wayne Anderson, who's another regular listener. And I believe Wayne is working for Microsoft in security. And Wayne says this, he says, with the shadow of a recession looming and investment cycles are changing, what have we learned since the last one for how we become secure in an economically constrained environment? And what will be different now than 2018 or 2000? Seven, and I think it's basically he's basically asking more or less the same question of the allocation of resources to security or the lack thereof. At this point, as you take a look at a recession, you know, and we're seeing inflation creeping up, the, the Fed is looking at adjusting interest rates to try to uh, control the inflation. Uh, ultimately, businesses have to balance the books. And the purpose of a business is to make money. Um, and, and similarly, government organizations also have to live within their means. Um, the, the taxpayers are demanding it and sending representatives to uh, their legislatures to hold the government uh, administrators accountable. So ultimately, for us that are on the technology side of the house, we need to make a better business case for why we need to be investing in cybersecurity. And ultimately, cybersecurity preserves the integrity of the information technology systems that uh, fuel the economy, that fuels that business. But typically, we found over the last 30 plus years, um, we fellow IT uh, people haven't done a really great job of uh, understanding how to articulate that business case. Over, there's encouraging signs that folks are getting it. I mean, it is cybersecurity is now on the agenda in boardrooms, in classrooms, lunchrooms, and now even living rooms. 
So we need to be able to show where the value proposition is, the return on investment, and, and the like. And we've been doing a lot of work here at SEI, and I would uh, encourage the audience to take a look at our website and our blogs uh, at sei.cmu.edu, where we've done some research to show some of those best practices out there. But if you're going to be recession-proof, you always have to show the value proposition for not only the internal competition for resources, but also to the end consumer, uh, showing that, in fact, if they're going to give you any of their data, that you're going to be a good custodian of it. And that's the strength of uh, a lot of the top performing businesses that are um, proving themselves worthy and recession proof uh, during these uncertain economic times. Well, certainly when your customers' data, personal data, credit cards and the like, social security numbers are released onto the web, that doesn't do your corporate reputation any good. That's for sure. So now another type of attack that we're hearing about all the time uh, is ransomware. So can you tell us about ransomware and how do these attacks take place? Ransomware is, in fact, a, a thorny issue right now all around the world. And uh, you know, we've got cyber burglars that are popping up everywhere. As I mentioned in the introduction, you can go online and you know, literally download courses on how to uh, be a hacker, how to create uh, malicious software such as ransomware. But for those who don't know what ransomware is, in essence, folks that are out there uh, engaging in ransomware are criminals. They're cyber crooks. And they are creating uh, programs or downloading uh, programs because now you can do ransomware as a service. You can go buy access to a piece of uh, code that uh, can institute a ransomware attack, but they'll send it to the victim, uh, often through a phishing or a targeted spear phishing uh, attack, launch the code, it'll uh, move laterally, and it'll encrypt your data. And then if you want to unencrypt your data and have access to the data that they've tampered with, you have to pay them a bounty. You know, basically, uh, pay up or we're going to keep your data from you, or we may even destroy it and uh, make it irretrievable. Really sophisticated ransomware crooks are very patient as well, and they'll wait until you do your five or six backups before they go and they trigger it and deny you access to your own data. So we're seeing that around the world. Uh, most recently, Costa Rica's government has been you know, kind of blackmailed with uh, ransomware, but it certainly is a plague uh, upon our house. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's ways that you can reduce your risk exposure to ransomware. Uh, we've posted some stuff on our website to help folks understand ransomware as well as what you can do about it to prevent it. Uh, but ultimately, one of the things that uh, everybody should uh, consider in you know, different businesses. Talk with your law enforcement community ahead of time, your, you know, the FBI, Secret Service, your local police department, because in the event of a ransomware attack, the first time you exchange business cards with those folks who are there to help you should not be in the time of stress and crisis. So as you're building your incident response plans, and you should have one for ransomware, that gets exercised at every level of the company, all the way up to the board of directors, you should have already made uh, a, an arrangement to have met law enforcement officials who can bring um, resources to bear to help you if in fact you're hit with ransomware and to protect yourself ahead of time, I suggest you uh, hit our website and see some of the recommendations that my team has put together. So ransomware uh, is the cause primarily uh, human failure, such as uh, people succumbing to uh, spear phishing attacks, or is it te technical penetration of systems? It's typically going to be um, 
uh, a phishing attack that's coming in. Uh, often there's two different types. There's a spray and pray, as we call it, where the attacker will go uh, shoot out messages to a wide range of folks and just see who, who clicks the link. But then there's also uh, targeted spear phishing where the attacker has done their research on the individual and has a carefully crafted message um, that they're, they're enticing the individual to click the link because they, they look through the carefully crafted message to establish a measure of trust where the individual trusts that, oh yeah, this looks real, this looks legitimate, and obviously I got to click this link because if it's coming from Greg, it's obviously going to be uh, clean. And that's not always a, the case. You should always be on guard uh, for malicious uh, sent emails and other transmissions that are coming in. So these kind of ransomware attacks then are partially technology and partially partially carefully researched uh, careful, careful research about the intended target. Right. And there's a lot of uh, the crooks that are out there that are uh, literally not the organized crime groups. Although I think the organized crime groups, uh, the evidence shows that they're uh, highly successful. Their batting average is uh, way, way up there right now. But we still are seeing uh, not the highly organized, highly skilled organized crime people doing these ransomware. We are seeing more and more individuals that are going on the net and they are downloading um, ransomware as a code capabilities and they are uh, targeting their local areas, they're targeting local businesses. And this is something that's going on not only here in the United States, but around the world. So the, the cost of entry for attackers continues to go down whereas the cost of defense continues to be a, a high cost for businesses and governments everywhere. We have another question, again, from Arsalan is coming back, and he says, Arsalan Khan, he says, every day we see cybersecurity threats around the world. Why is it still so hard to make a business case for cybersecurity, and what's the role of culture. So so Arsalan is really focused on this this issue of uh, applying resources, sufficient resources to security and why does this problem even exist? Let me share with you if I may my taxonomy for the threats that are out there because there's so many that are out there. Um and this taxonomy was developed um in conjunction with my friend and colleague Andy Osmond who we worked together at DHS. We served uh, in the same office. He was my boss. I was his deputy. But first of all, from a threat perspective, I contend that you've got six um, threats that are out there that every organization needs to be prepared for in the cyber uh, terrain. One is spies. And those spies could be nation state actors, but they could also be folks who are engaged in industrial espionage. They're seeking a competitive advantage by getting access to your data so that they can act faster than you in a particular issue. Secondly, we've got burglars. Uh, you know, these are the cyber criminals that are out there that are trying to seek financial gain. The third group are what I call cyber muggers, you know, and the, uh, the North Koreans were a great example with Sony. You know, they mugged Sony. But then again, everybody who has teenage kids have run into cyber uh, bullies and, uh, you know, they're trying mugging their other high school classmates on the internet. And ultimately, muggers are trying to um, seek leverage so that they, you can influence the behavior of an entity or an individual. And there's muggers out there. The fourth are um, saboteurs. And saboteurs are very pernicious and are very difficult to detect. Now, they could be nation state actors who are planting you know, malicious code, uh, you know, kind of like cyber bombs uh, to go off at a time and place of their choosing. Or it could be a disgruntled employee who's you know, planted uh, some sort of logic bomb thinking that they may get uh, terminated and they're going to stomp out the door. 
you've got to plan for saboteurs and you've got to take active controls and implement them to prevent sabotage to your, to your data. Um, the fifth are vandals. Uh, and vandals will typically go out there and they're trying to get their message out and, and impugn your message. They're trying to get, seek an upper hand to discredit the organization or the individual. And anonymous is a great example of folks who have uh, been cyber vandals for a long time uh, and trying to get their message across. But as I previously uh, mentioned, Michael, you know, as you take a look at the threat environment, I contend that over 95% falls back down to those careless, negligent, indifferent, and confounded people within your own midst who have misconfigured, who have not properly installed stuff, who aren't keeping up with patches, who are uh, exercising poor practices. That, that is the number one cause of most cyber uh, threats coming in you know, and the risks that are out there. But as an executive, you've got to plan for all of these different threats that are out there. And then further, as I get off the stage on this question, these type of uh, threats have been here since well before the internet. So putting, making your business case and putting it before the board, putting it before your corporate process, you've got to put it in terms that everybody understands. And often drawing the analogy to the physical world gives you an advantage in the corporate uh, budgetary process so that you can, in fact, show, hey, here are the different types of threats. Here's the type of controls that we need to employ to buy down our risk. And then from there, you're in a better position to arm yourself with the evidence to make the business case. Hopefully that's helpful taxonomy for folks. You mentioned 95% of the of the cybersecurity issues that arise are from you are essentially human error and experience, what have you. What is that other 5%? The other 5% are those other threats out there, spies, burglars, muggers, saboteurs, and vandals. And Elizabeth Shaw wants to know where is all of this going? Where is cybersecurity going and the nature of threats? Where is it headed? Well, I think the threats are going to continue to stay in those lanes, Elizabeth, as you take a look out there. Um, also, where it's heading is, is we're going to see more people jumping in to certain areas it, motivated by what their intended end states would be. You know, if they want to get data, they're, you know, they're going to go after certain things, uh, likely into spies or you know, if they're uh, crooks, they're, they're trying to get access to data that they can monetize. Um, as, as we see the price for the offense going down even further, we've got to counteract to make sure that we have uh, effective, efficient, and secure uh, defenses. But I'm seeing also, if you're a small and medium business out there who doesn't have the ability, like the government or big uh, corporate entities, we're going to see more and more investments in managed uh, security service providers. MSSPs, where we're uh, seeing them providing collective defense in a lot of different areas. So um, we're also seeing some of the internet service providers doing upstream protections for the at-home users. And um, as we see more competition in the internet service provider market, that will be a competitive advantage for those folks that are ISPs that can I in fact provide that upstream protection to filter out some of those malicious transmissions that are flooding the internet right now. And then finally, from an endpoint standpoint, I think you're gonna see uh, folks that are buying phones, laptops, et cetera, uh, where the demand signal from the consumer is, is I want security built in from the start. I don't wanna have to add it on because that's too complex. Government policy, what should government policy be when, regarding cybersecurity? I mean, as a, as, a, as a consumer, I know my personal information has been leaked repeatedly and is available for sale out there. Well, there's two issues that need to be uh, on, on, the, on the agenda of every citizen here in the United States, but literally around the world as well. 
Um, one is, is here in the United States, we need to have a very open and public conversation on privacy versus security. I contend you cannot have privacy without security. And on the same token, I contend you can't have security without privacy. Here in the United States, every state is doing their own thing. We don't necessarily have a cogent federal um, game plan for privacy that the citizens understand. And I think uh, Congress needs a little bit of education too as to all the different options that are available, but also what all the implications are. So I think a very public and open conversation on privacy and security is long overdue here in the United States. And then further, I think um, the, the marketplace really needs to take an introspective look as to the quality and the efficacy of the security in their products. Um, instead of security being a feature to turn on or configure, we need secure by design. We need to have resilience built into a lot of our products, our, our code base and such. And that's something that we at Carnegie Mellon and the Software Engineering Institute's uh, CERT division, we're working with industry to show where the evidence-based research indicates that we need to do better when it comes to software and systems and hardware, supply chain, et cetera. So those are two things right off the bat that I think we need to do better. Well, it's great advice and practical advice. And unfortunately, with that, we're out of time. Craig, thank you so much for taking your time to be with us today. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Michael. Everybody, we have been speaking with Greg Tuhill. He is a retired Air Force Brigadier, Brigadier General. He is the director of the CERT division of the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. And he's certainly one of the most prominent figures in cybersecurity today. Everybody, thank you for watching, especially those folks who ask such great questions. Now, before you go, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button at the top of our website so we can send you updates. And if you're on LinkedIn, subscribe to our newsletter on LinkedIn, and we'll keep you informed. Tell your friends, check out CXOTalk.com, and we will see you again next time. Thanks, everybody.